want to make sure we know exactly what the SQL statement should look like to make sure that we have logged in. All right? What constitutes a successful login? What constitutes an unsuccessful login? So that's one thing I want to do. Um, after I do that, we're going to write the code that does it, and we're not going to use, we're, we're not going to have our SQL tied to a visual component. All right, because when we log in, if we successfully log in, we want to go to one page. If we have not successfully logged in, we simply want to display an error message. So this isn't like other queries that we have done where we're going to take the results of the query and display them somewhere on the page. All right. Um, generally speaking, we can create our queries a couple different ways. We can sort of use the built-in functionality of ASP.NET um, and use the data source and the grid view and all that. Or we can sort of custom code them. So we can go in and we can programmatically create the data source and create the SQL statement for it and so forth. In other words, we can write C sharp code to do that. Um, there's reasons to do both. There's cases where the simpler way, the way that we've been doing it so far, works just fine. So why not do it in that case? But there's other cases where it's probably better just to write it yourself. All right. So therefore, it's important to know and understand both ways so you can handle either of the two situations. First of all, what I'd like to do is I'm going to put up on the board what the user table looks like. All right. Because the user table obviously is the one that um, we're going to use to verify if the person is a legal user or not. Um, if you remember, we said that we were going to use the email address like the user ID. So that's what they're going to enter in. So the user table looks like this. Drum roll, please. Oh, okay. <laughs> I think I grabbed the wrong copy of the polls application. Last year's? No, not last year's. I'm not that bad. Uh, I'm not that bad today. I think I just pulled like last week's. Yes, I did. I pulled from week eight, and this is actually week nine. Here we go. A user table is called user table. Why didn't I call it user, by the way? Any ideas why I didn't call it user? I know, it's like, I, I ain't a mind reader. Why would I know why you didn't call it user? I didn't call it user because I was afraid that was a reserved word. Sometimes in languages, there's words that you shouldn't use because they have a special meaning in the language. For example, I would never call a database table select, right? Because select means something in SQL. So if I tried to use a database table of select, it's liable to give me grief. And I can't say I remember as a fact, but I sort of in the back of my mind remember calling a table user wasn't a good idea. So I called it user table. Um, maybe I'm mistaken, but that was, that was, uh, that was what I had. So, we have four fields in this table. We have a user ID. So that's 
So it's called the user table. We have a user ID. We have the email address, which we're going to use as the login. We have the user password. And we have the full name. So, we have the screen, and it's going to have a user ID, or email address, password, and then a login button. When we click that login button, the values of these fields are going to be used to create a SQL statement. All right, to see if it's a valid user or not. Spend a minute to think of what you think the SQL statement would look like. Now keep in mind this could be done a couple different ways. I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about the way that I think is, is best. So what's the logic look like? What's the SQL statement that we're going to want to do? If the user ID exists. Okay, if the user ID exists. Is that the only thing that we're going to check? Then if it does look up, the, pa the password is correct. Okay. We could do something like that. We could first look up to see if the user ID exists. Then if the user ID exists, we could look to see if the password matched. All right. If the user ID didn't match, then um, we could display a different error message. Some sites use that strategy, right? I know when you go to log in to Tumblr, for example, it first asks you for your email address. If your email address is right, then it asks you for your password. If your email address is not right, it tells you there's no user with that email address. Do we like that? Do we like that approach? What's the advantages and disadvantages of that approach? What's the alternative to that approach? Yes? Could you put like if um, the user um, ID or like the email and password equal each other? Well, the user and I uh, and password are going to equal each other, right? It'll be because, the same, like. Okay, I think you're on the right track. Yeah. It's not going to be that the user ID is going to, or the email address is going to equal the password. Is that the user ID is going to match what's in the table, and the password is going to match what's in the table. So they're not going to match each other, but they're going to match the respective values in the table. That's the alternative. So we kind of have two approaches that we could take here. We could first retrieve the user ID and see if that exists. If that exists, we could tell the user, all right, please enter your password. If it doesn't exist, we could display an error saying that user ID doesn't exist. Then we can ask for the password and verify that. The other approach we could take is go and allow the user to enter in the user ID and password, and then see if there's a row in the database that matches that. If there is, then you log on. If not, then it's not a successful log on. And that's the approach that we're going to take. How many people have the same email address in our table? No, no one, right. I, I, I asked that question awkwardly. Everyone has their own email address. So it's not going to be a case of mzellers at lorraineccc.edu, there'll be two rows to match up, one that has a valid password and one that doesn't have a valid password. There's only going to be one person that has mzellers at lorraineccc.edu as, as an email address or user ID. And we can guarantee that, right? We guarantee that by making a unique index on the email address. So there can't possibly be two people with the same email address in here. What is a select statement going to look like? What's the select statement that's going to look like that's going to verify that there is a row that matches the 
user ID and password. Um, select user ID. Using the syntax of, of the ASP.NET data objects, where user ID equals question mark, where password e and password equals question mark, and those question marks are going to get filled in at runtime, and they're going to get filled in from the text boxes that we have on our page. Now, that's good, and we could do that. If someone entered in the right user ID and password, I keep saying user ID, I mean email address. Someone entered in the right email address and password. What are we going to get? We're going to get their user ID. What if they didn't enter in the right user ID and password? What are we going to get? You're absolutely right. We are going to get nothing. <laughs> All right? We're not going to get anything if they've entered in an improper user ID. And not just an improper user ID or an improper password, but an improper combination. So the thing with this strategy is we're not going to tell the user which one they messed up. We're not going to tell the user that they messed up the user ID and or they messed up the password, which probably from a security perspective is better, right? It's better not to say, well, gee, you got the right user ID, but the password is wrong, all right? Because then you can just work on the password. It's probably better just to say, hey, you have the wrong combination of things. All right. We, so we have one of two options with this. Either we are going to get the user ID of the person that's logged in, or we're going to get zero rows in the database. So we're either going to get one row or zero rows. We could make this work, and it wouldn't be that hard. But I'm going to simplify it a teensy bit by doing this. Select count star from user table, where email equals question mark and password equals question mark. What is that going to give me? Yes? It's going to count everything where those two fields equal the input and then give it zero. Exactly. How many rows is this going to return? This will always return one row, right? Because if there's a match, it will return one row that has a value of one. One. If there's not a match, it's going to return, return one row that has a value of one. Zero. All right. <clears throat> so. successfully logged in or not. All right. We could have done it the other way, but this simply simplifies the logic a little bit. All right. And let me rephrase that. We could do it this way. I may actually go back and do it the other way. All right. I, I, I lied a little bit. 
right? Because um, uh, I'm thinking about something else. And something else that I'm thinking of is this. All right? What do you think other pages will need to know if the person is logged in? What are the other pages in our application going to need to know if they've logged in successfully? Yes. The user ID. And maybe the full name, right? If we were going to put a greeting on top of the page that says, welcome, Mike Zellers, or whatever. So now that I think about it, I'm going to make my select statement look like this. Select like user ID, full name, from user table, where email address equals question mark, password equals question mark. I'm either going to get zero rows or one row. If I get zero rows, that means it's not valid. If I get one row, it is valid. And I'm going to have the user ID and full name. And I'm going to remember that username and full name. The question is, is where do I remember it? All right. Where do I remember it? Because do I want to remember it just on the very next page? No. I want to remember it for the entire web, for the entire browser session. All right. We talked about browser sessions a little bit at the end of class last time. What's a browser session? Well, essentially it's just what it implies from the time you open a browser and log on to a site until either the session times out or you log on or you close your browser window, right? The web server doesn't know if you have decided I've had enough of this, I've had enough of Canvas for today and now I'm gonna go and read about the Indians in the World Series, right? So they don't know that you have gone and left Canvas and have gone to ESPN. But it will know if 20 minutes have gone by and it hasn't gotten a request from you. And at that time, it can expire the browser. Now, deciding the right timing for a session to expire is something that you have to look at your application and your users and figure out how to, how to handle that, right? Because if you make it too long, if you were to make it eight hours, the session timeout period, then the web server is going to have to remember everyone that just logs on, even if they just logged on for 30 seconds to see if they've had any email. They're going to have to remember that information about that session for eight hours. And that would be a resource drain on the server. If you make the timeout period five minutes, for example, then a person might not be able to walk to the bathroom and come back without having to re-log in again. Or if they get a phone call while they're working on something. Or if they're working on a test and it times out. So you really have to know sort of how your users are using the application. And you actually can change it for a certain page. I can make a page have a certain timeout period. So for example, maybe the default for Canvas is 20 minutes. Whereas if you go into the mode of taking the test, they give you a longer period of time. You know, as long as the test is going to be or something along those lines. All right. So. That's sort of the preview. Where I'm now going to go and I'm going to put the, I'm going to make the login page, and I'm going to put in the code that's going to do the login, and we'll run it and we'll remember who the person is. And because there's a little bit of typing here, I'm going to copy and paste from another um, application that I have, just to save the pain of watching me type. So we're going to make my login page. So add a new file. Mm -hmm. 
web form. I'm going to call it login. Dot ASPX. And I'm going to put in this guy text box for the user ID and a text box for the password. Again, in the interest of time, I'm not going to label these, but please label them on your site when you do this. So I'm going to put a actually two text boxes and a button. And we're going to put a label, and this label is going to be if there is an error logging on. I'm going to go and change these to be have a meaningful ID. Again, because I'm going to be writing code to use these. Sort of a good rule of thumb is if you're writing code for a control, you know, make sure it has a good ID. Uh, a good ID. Some of the labels that I'm not going to write code, like if I just have a static label that says email address, and I have a static label that says um, whatever, um, I don't need to, to give, I don't really bother changing the ID. But it's a good idea to change the ID um, if you are going to code it. So I'll call this text box txt email. And we'll call this txt password. Now, if you notice, when we look at this, we don't want this to be a plain text box. We want it to not show what the user is typing in, as typically is done with a password, right? It doesn't echo the values on the screen. So I can set the text mode to this field to password. These other things I think are new in the 4.5 ASP.NET, the dates, the email, the, the, the month, and so on. These correspond to HTML5 input controls. Remember back in the old days, prior to HTML5, you simply had a text box. With HTML5, you now have sort of souped up text boxes. Text boxes that you can say represent a color. And then you get the operating system's default color picker, which is kind of cool. All right? But this is none of those things. This is merely a password. I'll go and call this logon. So login or logon? I, I never, I am never consistent with that. And I apologize for that. Login. And I will call this button login. I will try to be consistent today. All right. So this is the general UI. We could add validation to this, and we probably should, right? We could validate to make sure that the email address and password were both entered. All right. We could make sure that the email address fit the format of an email address all right, by applying the proper um, validator controls. But I assume you can all do that, so I'm not going to do that. We would want to do that, right? You might say to yourself, well, what's the, what's the reason, why worry validating it? If I type in the wrong email, if I type something in that's not a valid email address, when I go and check the database, it's not going to find it, and it will come up with an error and say it's invalid, and the person's going to have to re-enter it. Well, that's requiring the server to get involved to do the database lookup. If something isn't a valid email address, we don't even want to send it to the server for the server to bother with it. 
right? We want to do it on the client side and catch it immediately. So, strictly speaking, you're correct, but part of the reason we do client side validation is number one, to give our users an immediate response, and number two, to lessen the burden on the server. So the server doesn't have to do work when, when the data is known, is, is easily known to be invalid. All right, I'm gonna go and double click this guy and I'm gonna get into the button login code. And this is where I'm going to copy and paste from uh, one last thing. I'm gonna call this label label error. All right. So this is where I've got to copy and paste this chunk of code. And we'll go through this a step at a time. I'm going to correct some of these things. Error. Thank you. What did we say we wanted the SQL to be? Select user ID. Full name. from user table where email equals question mark and user password equals question mark. txt email txt password So right now, I'm just going to display in the error message either they've logged in or that they have not logged in. We'll go make it do something else later. I'm going to verify that this works because I'd hate to spend 20 minutes explaining how this code does what it's supposed to only to find out that the code doesn't do what it's supposed to. All right? So let me go in and try this, make sure I've spelled everything right and so on. So let me go and run this. take a quick nap. All right. If I enter garbage in here, it tells me it's unsuccessful. All right, it must work. That was a joke. All right. I only tested one of the conditions. Just because it gives me that it's not a successful login when they don't log in doesn't mean it works. For it to work, I need to test the successful login. And if I remember right, and I'll look up in the database here, that's not the one. One of the names. mzellers at lionccc.edu and a password of password. 
All right. So I type in Amzellers at Lorraine CCC.edu. Whoops. That should be a dot. And I type in password. Notice I've seen this on a lot of browsers control where they have a little eyeball. What's that for? I mean, it shows you your password. When would you especially maybe want to use that? Just to make sure you spelled it right. And I find this especially useful on like a, a mobile device, right? Especially when you have, you know, sort of Sasquatch hands, right? Giant hands and you try to press one button and you end up pressing like five different letters and you don't know which one of them took. If you click on that, it shows you which one took and it can save you a little bit of grief with that. Notice that I didn't have to do anything to get that. Um, I simply define that this as a password control. That's a function of the browser. All right, so as long as you define it as a password, if that functionality exists in the browser, you'll get it. All right, and that, that's, that's pretty cool. All right, so drum roll please. I click log on and it tells me I'm successful. So yay, it works. All right, okay, now I can explain it. And I'll tell you, I do this every time the Indians make a World Series. All right. <laughs> I'm actually going to put comments in my code, all right, to explain this, to explain how these statements work. So you guys are lucky to be this year instead of any year since, what, 1997? I wasn't even working here in 1997, all right? Um, but at any rate, I'm going to go through and I'm going to put comments in the code to explain each part. Here's an important thing to remember. This code that you see here, all this code, like up through here, is like what you get if I simply drag and drop a SQL data source on the page. Actually, that would be like everything from here to here. That is the code that automatically sort of gets generated for you, that you configure by setting the properties. So even though this code looks different to you, believe it or not, we've done this already. We just didn't handwrite the code. We used the visual property inspector to go in and say, all right, the connection string for this guy's connection string. The SQL statement that I want is select user ID, comma, pa um, full name from user table where blah 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 equals blah blah blah. Where does the first field come from? It comes from the user, uh, it comes from the email address text box. Where does the second field come from? It comes from the password text box. So all this stuff is the stuff that we've done already except we haven't handwritten the code for it. We did it by dragging the SQL connection over and choosing the properties, hitting the configure. I'll go and do it now and I'll just delete it. So like if you do this, if I go and drag over a SQL data source and hit configure, Essentially, what it's doing is it's giving us a wizard to provide the answers to the questions that we write in code. All right? What is the connection? Oh, yeah. It's a connection string. What's our SQL statement? Select user ID full name from user table where email equals question mark and password equals question mark. So there's our SQL statement. 
Now what do we have to do? We have to say where those question marks came from. All right. The first question mark for user ID comes from the form, and it comes from, I'm sorry, it comes from the control, and it comes from the control TXT email. The second one comes from a control, and it comes from the control TXT password. And so on. I'll hit cancel and delete this guy because we don't really need him. Because we have written our own code to do all that. All right, we create the SQL data source object. That's what that line does. And I'm going to go in a little more detail with my comment, uh, comment because the Cavs won the championship this year. You guys really came in a lucky year. All right. <laughs> Uh, create data source object, and the data source object is the object we use to perform the query of the database. All right? So we create that object. The next two lines. These automatically get set when you select the database connection in the in the wizard that we looked at before. So we have to that that operation of picking connection string actually does two things. Actually causes like two instructions to happen. If we look at our web config file, we will see that a connection string consists of two parts. There's the part that is the connection string. And then there's a part that is a provider name. The connection string is the details that you need to connect to that particular database. The provider name is the mechanism by which you're accessing the database. So, in the wizard, we only answer that we only answer the one question. We only ask for the connection string. And when we, when we give it the connection string, it pulls both those fields out of the web config file. But since we're doing this by hand, we specify both of them. And we simply say, go to, what's all this stuff say? Wow. All this says is, all this part says is look in the web config file. That's all that says. Look in the web config file. Find the thing in the connection string section called connection string and give me the provider name. So, looks up in the web config file. In the configuration strings, it finds this one and it gives me the provider name. The next line does the exact same thing except it gives me the data connection string. So if I'm going to write comments for these lines of code, these lines of code look in web config and pull the two parameters needed to connect to our database. All right. That's what the that's what the, these two lines do. That happens in the wizard when we simply select a connection string. It automatically goes and pulls those two values. Now we're going to define the SQL statement that we want to run. In our case, it's a query. So far, the only SQL statement we looked at is a select statement. Is that the only statement that exists in SQL? Well, you already have a hint. No. All right. What are the other kinds of statements that you have? Pardon me? 
Well, there's there's a create. We don't use that a lot within an application. Update. Insert, update, delete, oh, okay. and so on. There are other kinds of st statements. Notice, though, which one we're interested in. We're interested in the select command. So our data source has associated with it a query, a select statement. And what is our query? Well, it's exactly what we would have typed in in that field. Select user ID full name from user table where email equals question mark and user password equals question mark. Now, what did we have to do in the query next as we were going through the wizard? We had to say where those parameters, where those blank spaces were getting their values from. Right? When I said this was my SQL statement, when I typed that in into the configuration of the data source, the very next screen asked me, where am I getting those two question marks from? So here we're defining the SQL statement, and it's a query with parameters. If I can type. These next two lines tell where to get the values of the parameters. So we have those two blank spaces, those two question marks. We're saying where we're going to fill those in. Because we can't leave them as blank marks, right? We have to tell them what data we're, we're interested in. Well, what, who are we trying to log in? Well, we want to pull the user ID from, or I'm sorry, the email address from the email address uh, text box and the password from the password text box. All right. The next line, I'm going to be a little cryptic here. The next line is specifying how we want to access the data, the mode for accessing the data. And we are actually accessing this in a very simple mode, right? We're not doing a lot with the data that we're retrieving. We're just essentially looking to see if something is there. And if there's something there, we got a winner, they can log on. If there's nothing there, then it's an invalid login. All right? So this sets the mode of how we are going to use data. And in this case, we're taking a simpler option. I actually don't remember off the top of my head what the more complicated option is, but this is the simpler of the two options. This line actually executes the query. Now, as a general rule, Forget about this specific SQL statement, but as a general rule, how many rows can a select statement return? One. Well, this one can only return one, but as a general rule, it could return many, right? We don't know. It might return none. It might return one. It might return 50. We don't know. It depends on the SQL statement. Right? If we had a different SQL statement, for example, that looked at the votes that were cast instead of the user ID, then it would return a row for every vote that was cast. All right. Now, in this case, we know it's only going to return one, and we're going to file away that information for now. But we know that, in general, SQL statements have the potential to return a bunch of rows. All right. What this does is this executes the query and stores the results in what's called a cursor. And that's kind of an unfortunate name because people think of cursor as this little blinky thing. 
right? A cursor is simply um, like a table of data, like, like, a, like an array of data. And specifically, with a cursor, you read through it. You look at the first thing, you look at the second thing, you look at the third thing, you look at the fourth thing, you look at the fifth thing. So you read it almost like pages in a book. You look at page one, you look at page two, you look at page three. Except with a cursor, there's no like looking back. All right, you're reading, you're doing what's called a sequential read. All right, and that's what this did. This set us in the, set us up in the mode to be able to do a sequential read. So we now have the data, all the rows that the SQL statement retrieved, in more or less an array called my data. And my data could have zero rows in it. My data could have a million rows in it, in general terms. In this specific case, there's only two options, though. There could be one row returned, or there could be zero rows returned, right? Because we made the email address a unique index. Therefore, there cannot be duplicate email addresses, all right? in sort of an array. Now, if you go to interview with Highland Software and they ask you about cursors, you probably want to have a better answer than say it's sort of an array, all right? You probably want to have a more definite answer. But for purposes of this class, sort of an array that we read sequentially. And what does read sequentially mean? It means reading it in order. We find that we look at the first row that's retrieved, we look at the second row that's retrieved, we look at the third row that's retrieved. So, we would execute, if there were a million rows in this table, in, in, in the table of results, to read them all, we'd need to read that cursor a million times. That data reader is probably the precise word for it. But, we know that the only two possibilities are zero and one. In this case, there's either it's either a legal login or it's not a legal login. Therefore, we know we only have to read it once and see if we have found something. That's what my data dot read does. This is the first read statement. It's the only read statement. Therefore, this reads the first row in the result set. Actually, it reads the next row in the result set. But since we haven't done any reads before, guess what? The next row is the first row. Since this is the first read, it reads the first row in the result set. And guess what? Either there's a first row or there isn't a first row. So this read function is going to return a true or a false. True means that it got a row. False means it did not get a row. All right? So if we had this in a loop, for example, and there were 10 rows in the data set, 10 times through the loop this would return true, the 11th time through the loop it would return false because there aren't any more. We hit the end of the line. So that read always reads the next row in the result set because it's reading them sequentially, it's reading them in order. And it returns either a true or false. So, since this is the first time we're reading that result set, it's essentially looking for the first row in the result set. And it's going to return either a true or a false. 
A true indicates that it found the first row. We have a winner. A false indicates that it's invalid, and we don't have a user that matches that. That's exactly what we have here. The first read found a row and returned true. Therefore, we have a successful logon. We're going to forget about the rest of the stuff for a minute. The first row read did not find a row. And return false. Therefore, unsuccessful logon. So, you see we set the error message, either successful or unsuccessful. So we set the message. set the message. What do you suppose these two lines of code are doing? Yes? Are you storing them? That was the username, the full name, or the user across different pages? Exactly. It's storing the username ID and full name in what is called a session variable. All right? What's a session variable? Well, it's a variable that's going to be remembered throughout the session, throughout the browser session, as long as this session is alive. So, as long as this doesn't time out, or I don't log out, which I haven't written a log out page yet, or as long as I don't close the browser window, it is going to remember the first name and the user ID in a variable that's called user ID and full name. Session variables are really just like an array, only they're a different kind of an array. Normally we've seen uh, arrays where the subscripts are like 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. In this case, the, the index for the array is a name. There's a term for that, and I don't remember what the term is. All right, off the top of my head. But essentially, we're storing an array of variables and we're using names instead of numbers to remember them. So we have a session variable called user ID that's storing my data zero. We're using a session variable called full name that stores my data one. Where do you think my data zero and one come from? How did I know that user ID was zero and full name was one? Exactly. When we go back and look at the select statement, in the select statement I'm selecting two fields, user ID and full name, and I'm selecting them in that order, user ID and full name. Therefore, therefore, therefore what? Therefore, given that we start numbering everything with zero, when we read and we've gotten our first data uh, um, row from this. This my data could be a collection of fields. We can refer to the field by the field number. So my data zero is the zeroth element. Remember we start counting with zero. So that corresponds to user ID. Full name one corresponds to, or my data one responds to full name. All right, so piece of cake, right? Now, let's redirect it to another page. 
Let's redirect it to another page. All right. I'm going to do this in two steps. First step I'm going to do is after they've successfully logged on, I'm going to send them to default to. Why did I pick default to? I don't know. Why not? All right. How do you redirect? Well, the web server is changing the response. Normally, when you submit a form, you submit it back to itself. In this case, though, if they've successfully logged in, we don't want this page to display. We want to take them to another page so that they can continue voting or whatever it is they have to do. So we say response dot redirect, and then in parentheses, I specify the URL I want to redirect them to. So now, if they unsuccessfully log on, they go to, they stay on the same page, and they get an error message. If they successfully log on, they get sent to default to .aspx. All right, let's test this out. So I type garbage in here which again we should have actually I haven't tested this 100% thoroughly right I should test it where I type in the wrong password for me that's one thing I haven't tried so I'll just type garbage in here that's not my password and I click log in it tells me unsuccessful good so I type my valid password in and click log in. I get taken to that page. Yay. All right. Now, it would be great if this page acknowledged who I am and displayed my full name. Now, does it need to do the query again? No, because we've saved that name in a session variable. All right. So let's go in and let's put a label to do that. Do I 
what, I'm going to go back out and back back in. So I'm going to drag this label over here, and I'm going to change the label text to nothing. I'm going to change the name of the label to LBL full name. Now, I'm going to go into the page load event, and I'm going to say if. So this is checking to see if it's not null. Then I'm going to put in my label, full name, dot text, equals, two string. Did you need the exclamation point? Yes, because that's saying not. Nah. If it's not null, I want to put it there. If it's null, I want to ignore it. So what I'll do is I'll 
just put a string that says not logged on. Now, I have to do all this because remember that, well, I don't know if you can remember it because I don't think I've said it yet, but you can put any sort of object in a session variable. It doesn't have to be just a string or a number or anything like that. Now, you don't want to store too much in session objects because that can be a drain on the system. All right. But it could be anything. That's why I have to test to see if it's null and, and all that. So let's go and run this. This is coming to it before I've logged on, so it should say not logged on. wrong with my syntax there. Tell you what, I will look this up and I will post the correction to Canvas when I'm done. All right. The idea here is it will take that session variable and it will display it there. I don't have the proper syntax for that. All right. I will go unlock the door. <laughs>